Ohio, guys. <laughs> okay, we're live now. Well, greetings to all of you. Welcome Hello. to Calvary Braid Valley's midweek devotional Bible study. With myself, Pastor Rick, and my wacky sidekick, Arnie. Ernesto Valenzuela. <laughs> so, uh, just for the sake of time, we'll jump right in. I'll just pray the Lord's blessing upon our time. And then Ernie's going to sing two songs. The first song will be Indescribable by Chris Tomlin. If you want to uh, look up the lyrics on, uh, on your mobile phone or whatever device you might have, mm -hmm. Indescribable by Chris Tomlin, and then Simplicity, Simplicity. by Rand Collective will be the second song. If you want to get the lyrics, so, so, some of us may know it. So, let's pray. Then at the yeah. end, after I finish, Ernie's going to have one more song. We'll let him introduce that. So let's pray. Go ahead. And Father, we come before you, and Lord... Uh, these are unusual times, it's unusual circumstances that we're meeting this way uh, through the internet, through uh, the, the different um, social medias and internet, but Lord, you still keep us connected. Above all, we are connected, not just electronically, but we're connected by your Spirit. So, Father, I just pray that you would join our hearts together as we watch and listen. And especially, we pray that you join our hearts with yourself. So, Lord, bless this time. Bless this time of worship to just draw our hearts unto you. And bless this time of the scripture of speaking into our lives from your very word. So we ask your blessing upon this time in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 All right, like we said, we this off with indescribable Chris Tomlin.
well, welcome to the new COVID-19 reality. <laughs> yes, we have to isolate ourselves in our different homes and luckily the four of us are all in the same household so it's legal for us to be together and from our house to yours. We want to look at Psalm 62. I'm calling this certainty for uncertain times. And we are certainly in uncertain times. And many of us have questions um, uh, about the Lord, about what's going on, questions about uh, why God's allowing this. And we have some real answers, of course, in the scripture. And so we're looking, like I said, at Psalm 62. And Psalms, like the rest of Scripture, are best understood in the context in which they were written. Uh, but of course, Psalms has many, many standalone and uh, uh, live on itself <laughs> verses and passages. But the best understanding for the Psalms for that and for this, this work is in its context. And so we look at Psalm one, the first verse of Psalm 1, and there's an introduction to it that's actually part of the psalm. And my version is the ESV version of the Bible, so I'll be reading from that. You can follow along in whatever version you've had. Blah, blah, blah. It'd be nice if I could talk. But, um, <laughs> but uh, here we go. And we, we read at the start that this psalm was written to the choir master, according to Jeduthun. A psalm of David. Now, this tells us right off who wrote this psalm. This psalm, this is a psalm, a song written by David. And we know that it's a song, psalm, because it's to the musician, to Jeduthun. Jed, now, who is this Jeduthun? And why was he even included in Scripture? His name is for all eternity because every word of God is inspired of God and eternal. So uh, we have this man named Jeduthun that David directed this psalm to. Um, now he's directed to the choir master. Uh, other versions say or in modern language we would say the director of music. Um, and this Jeduthun was a Levite. He was one of the three chief singers at the tabernacle and at the temple that was set up by David when he brought the Ark of the Lord into Jerusalem. Uh, one of the other chief singers was a man named Heman. And the third was one whose name is a little bit more familiar to us, Asaph. Now, Asaph himself wrote Three or twelve psalms. Um, Jeduthun is given a nod, is talked about in three psalms, uh, this being one of them. And this other man, this third choir master or choir member, <laughs> um, Heman, uh, wrote one psalm. So these are important guys, these are inter interesting guys. And these were important guys in their days. They were, they were set up. So Jeduthun was, uh, you know, a, a chief singer, the chief of the choir. He was actually, um, well, you see where uh, it sets up. We see in Chronicles with the setting up of the um, singers for the tabernacle. In 1 Chronicles 16, and verse 41, it says this, With them, the, the choir, the singers at the temple uh, at that time of David. It was tabernacle, so at the temple. With them were Heman and Jeduthun and the rest of those chosen and expressly named to give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever. But this Jeduthun was more. He was a teacher. He was the instructor of the temple choir. We read in again in 1 Chronicles chapter 25 and verse 6, they, all the singers, were under the direction of their father, 
literal father because he had six sons who were all part of the choir and musicians and singers themselves. Um, they were under the direction of their father in the music in the house of the Lord with cymbals, harps, and lyres for the service of the house of God. Asaph, Jeduthun, and Haman were under the order of the king. So he was a chief singer. He was an instructor, and he was also a prophet. Three verses earlier in 1 Chronicles 25, it says this, Of Jeduthun, and the sons of Jeduthun, he had six, it lists their names, Gedaliah, Zerai, Yeshaiah, Shimei, Hashabiah, and Mattathiah, six sons of Jeduthun, under the direction of their father, Jeduthun, who prophesied with the lyre in thanksgiving and praise to the Lord. So we're getting more and more of this man, Jeduthun. He was, you know, a talented musician, head of the choir, an instructor of the choir, but he also used his musical talents to prophesy under the inspiration of the Lord. And not only was he uh, able to prophesy, he was one of David's personal prophets. We read in um, 2 Chronicles 35 and verse 15, and the setup and all this, the singers, the sons of Asaph, were in their place according to the command of David, and Asaph and Heman and Jeduthun, the king's seer. And the gatekeepers were at each gate. They did not need to depart from their service, for their brothers and Levites prepared for them. So Jeduthun is called the king's seer. Seer is another name for prophet. He sees the things of the Lord. So it's interesting that this psalm, first written or first inspired by David, was given to Jeduthun. So we see that Jeduthun was not only a gifted musician himself, but a teacher and an arranger of music, preparing the music for the choir. We see these same things today. And he was also a man tuned in to God. He was a man who, 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 who knew God, who heard from God and was a great source of strength and confidence and counsel for David, King David himself. So Jeduthun got probably, you know, now I'm speculating a bit. David wrote this psalm, passed it on to Jeduthun, who took the raw work of David as, as good and as gifted and as inspired and as powerful as it was, and then Jeduthun arranged it for the choir, arranged it um, for music in that. So we see both David and Jeduthun in this. And it's good to know that Jeduthun was a prophet himself and was tied in with, keep, tied in with God. And so um, we sort of get his influence a bit in this. Now there's a, a word that you see occasionally in the Psalms that uh, we don't know what it is. But it's especially important and effective here. It's the word selah, S-E-L-A-H. Some versions of the Bible and the Psalms, they have that in there. And some uh, have removed it. But nonetheless, it's there. We don't know today what it is. But the best guess, and, and most um, experts think that it's a musical term. It's for a pause in the music or, a, or something. It was a musical term. So I really see Jaduthan's hand in this. Um, a, a lot of times you look to where that Selah is in the Psalms, and it doesn't, in English, it doesn't really make sense. It kind of blocks the flow or comes in odd times. In this Psalm, it's perfect. Because this Psalm is basically three sections. And at the end of each section, verse 4, verse 8, and verse 12, well, verse 4 and verse 8, um, it has that Selah. And one w thing you can think of Selah is pause and think about this. That's why I said it doesn't always fit with where it is in English. But in the Hebrew and at the time of the music, it made perfect sense, I'm sure. Um, so God just was bringing this into smooth ordering and smooth working as a song to be sung, sung in there. So 
that's sort of the background to this psalm, and that's just the introduction, <laughs> the first part. So what is the context? I talked about the context of the psalm. What is the context? What's happening in this psalm? Why was it first written by David? You hear in, in, in so many of David's psalms, just a personal crying out of the heart, and it, you know, it, it's a sort of reaction or response to things that were going on with him. And um, uh, I get the sense in reading this, especially in, in verses 3 and 4 and 10, that, well, certainly we see in this, David was under attack. He was under attack by um, embittered and powerful men. And I get the sense that this was during the time of the coup by his son Absalom. You know, a coup is when someone comes in and, and disposes and takes down from power someone who's in power and puts themselves in that seat of headship of the government. And that very thing happened to David and to the nation Israel when David's son Absalom rebelled, carrying most of Israel with him. And interestingly enough, David had to flee. He left his throne. He left his, his palace. He left his capital. He left Jerusalem and went into social isolation <laughs> in another part of Israel. That sounds kind of similar to what we have. We're being forced by the circumstances that we see into social isolation where we can't gather together for church and be in the same building. We certainly can't be in the same room singing because uh, we have discovered that singing, um, if you have this virus, the, the COVID-19 virus, singing expels it. And if, it, if you have it, uh, if you're in a room singing, it goes out because it comes from the lungs, it goes out and gets on it just as, as easily as a, a cough or a sneeze if you're there. So. We're glad that we're all segregated and safe and we can sing at the top of our lungs and not bother anybody else um, and spread any germs. <laughs> so we see David perhaps writing this from that place that we're in now of social isolation, having to be away from the people that he loved and, and away and out of the things that he had. But this psalm was written to what was behind it. In the case of this, it was men, people, that attacked him and personally harmed him. We'll see in verse th verses 3 and 4. So let's, let's read the, that first section, uh, verses 1 through 4. And like I said, I'm using the ESV version of the Bible, and it says this. To the choir master, according to Jeduthun, a psalm of David. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. How long will all of you attack a man to batter him like a leaning wall, a tottering fence? They only plan to thrust him down from his high position. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouth, but inwardly they curse. Selah. Well, in verse 1, we read that my soul, my soul waits in silence. And this word wait, in the NIV, it, it translates this as finds rest. But this word wait has the meaning of quiet, patient, confident trust. Mm -hmm. It's not complaining. It's not moaning about, why me? Why does this have to happen to me? It's not lashing out in God in bitter anger. It's a soul at rest. Um, at rest with a confident, peaceful assurance of God's salvation. The word in Hebrew, the specific word itself, is literally stillness. 
that would, would read, For God alone my soul is still. And this word stillness is translated as silence, stillness, waits, rests. But the word gives the idea, gives a picture of, you know, stillness, of quiet water, of, of, of a, a, a peaceful countryside. Um, just yesterday, I was outside doing a little work in the garden, taking advantage of this, uh, you know, home isolation. And toward evening time, my attention just was, was drawn to the outside. There was, it, it, the wind had been blowing all day, you know, you could hear the tractors moving, you'd hear cars, you know, but in the evening, now because of the conditions, there wasn't traffic. You didn't hear the going home from, from work traffic. It just became quiet and still. The wind stopped blowing. The birds weren't even saying. It was just quiet and still and peaceful. You could feel it. You could feel the stillness and this quietness. And I just like, it was just like, oh, so refreshing. And I just like, ah. Oh just wanted to to stay there and, and and drink it in and feel this well that's this word stillness to wait my soul waits in silence rests in the lord beautiful term beautiful thing so now the the soul of the psalmist was feeling still was feeling peaceful was confident in the Lord despite the uncertainty around us. Because in verse 2, he knows, he rests. And God alone is my rock, my salvation or deliverance, my fortress, my refuge. I get the picture when I see this a fortress and a refuge of an Irish round tower. Now those of you that live in Ireland know exactly what I'm talking about when I talk about a round tower. But if you happen to not be in this country and live elsewhere and are listening, let me describe a round tower to you. A round tower is a tower that's round. <laughs> <laughs> well done. It it's, lives up to its name. Um, it's, it's strong towers built of big heavy stones, you know, same thing you would build a castle with and it was, it was a circular, you know, round tower tall. It would go up tall and, you know, would have a peaked roof. The door to this round tower was well up high. You couldn't reach it from the ground. And it was built by the monks and Christian leaders at the time, um, about a thousand years ago, to protect their valuables from Viking raids. Now, the, the church buildings were often, you know, targets of the Vikings when they would come inland and raid because of the gold and the silver and the, you know, the things they would need. They just wanted the valuables. Um, and so to protect these things, when there's a raid, they built these round towers and uh, they would ha take their, gather up their, their valuables, climb up a long ladder into the entrance of the tower, and then pull the ladder up behind them. And they were safe and their goods were safe. The Vikings could come in and plunder and pillage all they want, but they hopefully would stay and remain safe. That's like what we are in God. God is our round tower. God is our fortress, our refuge. We run to Him and are saved. We are secure and safe from harm in Him, exactly like what a round tower was. And so it says, God alone is my rock, my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. I like that. Yes, we are shaken by the things that are happening right now. We are bothered. We wouldn't be human if we're not. But we're not greatly shaken. You know, David was under serious attack. Yet he confesses, true from his heart, I am not greatly shaken. 
because my hope, my trust is resting in the Lord. We could be shaken and distracted by these current events around us, but as we look up, have our eyes on the Lord, we won't be greatly shaken. We're shaken, but not stirred. <laughs> shaken, but not stirred up and bothered by what we see and by what we experience. Well, verses 3 and 4 describe David's circumstances. That he was attacked. He was battered. They wanted to thrust him down from his position. Oh, oh what I could say about that with us. The attacks coming against us, personally in the church with this thing, wants to take it down from our, our position. Our position as believers, as Christian believers in Christ, our position is safe and secure in Christ. Yet these attacks that come in want to take us out of our secure position. But we won't let them. Will we, church? No. <laughs> no, no, we won't. Let me hear an amen. 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 <laughs> okay. Um, he's also being lied to, to his face, and slandered behind his back. And then comes the Selah, that musical term, or that term to, to pause and think about this. And that hint, I see, of Jeduthun's handiwork. Maybe he, he was inspired to put a, a stop right there, to stop and think about this when we're being attacked. Where do we have that place of stillness in our soul? So the psalm continues, and this second section is the section. It's, it's, it's a thing that really speaks to us. It's the thing that sort of inspired us um, to, to look at this psalm and to go for it. And it's so beautiful. It says this, verses 5 through 8, For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory, my mighty rock, my refuge is in God. Trust in Him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. Let me repeat that. Even if you had, if you read this out loud, speak to yourself. Speak these words to yourself. Confess them from your heart as we read these four verses again. For God alone, O oh my soul, wait in silence. For my hope is from Him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rest my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Now this first verse, verse 5, is one of those standalone verses. For God alone, O oh my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from Him. That's one that deserves to be in a plaque in our homes too, doesn't it? <laughs> but notice, look at this. David is commanding his soul to be confident and trust in God alone. David is speaking to himself. You know, waiting on the Lord, having trust in the Lord, waiting for God for deliverance, for a change in circumstances, for salvation, is an active, not a passive action. Notice what I think of that as active, it's something that you do. You actively do. You do this. Passive is 
You don't do anything. You just wait for it to happen. Waiting on God is not passive then. It's not just, oh, I'll just wait here and it'll happen and I'll have peace in my heart. No. It's, it's an action. It's active. David is commanding his soul to do this. The soul is the depths of your being, all that you are. David is commanding his soul. He says, for God alone, O my soul, wait in silence. He's telling his soul to wait in that stillness. Because this word silence, wait in silence, is very closely related to, but slightly different from that word in verse 1. But it means the same thing. Stillness. A peace. A lack of striving. So we must, shouldn't we, command our souls, command ourselves. I know we have to do this. When we get frustrated, when we get uh, anxious, we get worked up, command our soul. Wait in silence for God alone. Our hope is from Him. It's no, you know, this is it's an active thing of doing. It's no, no wimpy, hand-wringing, empty, worldly hope. Well, I hope we'll get through this. I hope good will come to me. It's not a, a something that's eased by a, a quote, you know, by a, a poet. You know, it's pretty much empty words. You know, hope in the Lord is an active, working, uh, on fire thing. But we do need to command ourselves. We need to tell ourselves, don't we? Self, soul, you wait on the Lord. You be quiet. You be still before Him. It's telling your soul, like it says in Psalm 46 and verse 10, Soul, be still and know that He is God. The verse says, be still and know that I am God. God speaking to us. Well, we can speak to us too, saying, soul, selves inside, be still, be at peace, and know that God is God. He's still in control. He's still on the throne. No one's brought him down from his lofty position. <laughs> so, we can be certain of something in these uncircumstance, uncertain circumstances that we we find ourselves in. We can be certain of God. The Lord will keep us. The Lord is our foundation. He is our rock. He is what we hope in and stand on. Verses 6 and 7 reminded us why we can hope in God. Again, I said, picture yourself in that round tower as, as we read this. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress, I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge, is God. Now in the seventh verse there it says that on God rests my salvation and my glory. That is an intriguing term to me. And in the context here, David is talking about his reputation, his honor. I think other versions of the Bible use honor for this instead of glory. And it gives the idea, the sense of what this, this word says. But glory is a great thing. God will give us glory. In Christ, we have the hope of glory. We don't want to let that hope be shaken. And that hope of glory, of what's ahead for all eternity, though not now on this earth, is glory. Here on earth, it, it reminds us, it takes us back to Psalm 3, verse 3, which says this, another verse that just lifts in here, and I've quoted and, and felt in my heart so much. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, and the lifter of my head. Mm. You want to know how to get peace 
in your heart how to get stillness? Let the Lord give you his glory and let the Lord be the lifter of your head. When the Lord lifts your head, it's to help you look at him and forget the circumstances around you that cause us to look down and look away and look in fear. We look up, we look in love and in peace and in confidence and in trust at the trustworthy God. Notice, I don't know if you noticed, I probably did, I stressed it a bit. There was a shift in David's tone in verse 8. He moved from looking inward to having an outward focus, wanting to help people from his shepherd's heart. You know, what a perfect type of leader to have. One who truly cares about the people and wants to minister to the people from his political throne, from David's political place. I almost want to, so I will. <laughs> I can mention President Trump in America. He used his, what other presidents have called, bully pulpit to call people to prayer and remind the nation of God. You know, good for him. He's doing this. Because you see David's shift in verse 8 from, you know, I will trust, I will, you know, which is all good and what, which we all should do. But then he says, verse 8, trust in him at all time, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Isn't that beautiful? I think that's so cool. Here's King David. You know, maybe he's deposed, maybe he's in shame, maybe he's, you know, and he's in social isolation, but he's still reaching out to the people, the people who have turned their back on him, if this is the case, the people who have wanted someone else to be their king and have gone for this other one. He says, trust in him, O people. Pour out your hearts before him. God is a refuge for us. He's reaching out. And blessing the people. Oh, it's just so so beautiful and gives such a good picture. And it gives a picture to us of the Lord, who, as a the good shepherd, gives us this message to each of us personally at this time. So let me repeat this and hear this as coming from the Lord. Trust in him, or maybe I'll put it this way: trust in me. At all times, O oh people, pour out your hearts before me. I am a refuge for you. So this ends the second section. And the psalm ends in another section of four verses with a, a reminder to us of the people, of those that where the attacks are coming from. And also a description of those who oppose him and thus that which opposes us. But it also takes us to a higher plane where we see, sort of see the whole picture with this closing of this psalm. And it says this, Those of low estate are but breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances they go up. They are together lighter than a breath. Well, people view themselves as important. <laughs> they view themselves as having weight, as having influence, as having you know something to say, and you better listen to me. Um, but the reality is, in the Lord's eyes, we are nothing but breath. We don't have weight. It's an interesting term. Uh, that the ESV says those of low estate. Literally in the Hebrews it says the sons of Adam are but a breath. And then it says the sons of substance 
of weightiness, of strength, sons of substance, those who view themselves or we view as being something, as having influence, as having an effect and having a say in our life, are a delusion. And it gives a great picture. You can put the people, whether a son of Adam or a son of substance, you know, of a low estate, the lower class, or the rich. Put them on a balance and it does, they don't stay there. They just float up. And the balance, you know, gets all up. It's like nothing in God's eyes. COVID virus and the effect of this, of this, this whole thing in God's eyes is nothing. You know, the people, those that are, has been called COVID idiots, <laughs> that are violating that, and those that are doing everything right and proper is under the Lord, are equal in God's sight. They're, we're all still as nothing. You know, the glory and honor and importance of this world is God's. Because he goes on to say that, 10 and 11, 12, put no trust in extortion, set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart on them. The ill-gotten gains are uh, worthless. And then David's, David says, once God has spoken, twice I have heard this that power belongs to God, and that you, to you, O Lord, belong steadfast love. For you will render to a man according to his work. So twice the Lord spoke this to David, or the author of this psalm. Power belongs to God. Power in, is in the sense of of physical strength, or power, or, or influence, or importance, weightiness belongs to God. He has real power. All power is allowed by Him. All influence comes in Him. Nothing happens in this world without Him allowing it. For whatever reason, God has allowed this pandemic to strike the world. So God has blessings, has good to come out of it. I'm seeing good already. I think even having to do this, you know, a, a webcast is good. And we've seen good fruit come from this already. So my soul is it still before God. <laughs> and so are we. And secondly, it says, Power belongs to the Lord, and also to Him belongs steadfast love. This is a great word. It's the Hebrew word chesed, which is really untranslatable into English. It means so much. The old King James Version used the single word mercy. Mercy. To translate this, this verse. Other translations of it, and it's, 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 it's love in the sense of goodness, kindness, mercy, God's favor, faithfulness that never ends. It's steadfast favor, steadfast goodness, steadfast mercy, steadfast kindness, all rolled up into one little Hebrew word that explains the unexplainable God. This word chesed best describes God. And there's no words we can put into it to translate it. And this alone belongs to God, doesn't it? So power and chesed belong to God. Stead, uh, steadfast love is a great translation of it because it's steadfast, it's never-ending, it's not, not break, breaking. Goodness and kindness, his favor and gladness towards us. And it ends, for you will render to a man according to his work. David tr trusted in the Lord for those enemies that came against him. He gives them into the Lord's hands. and knows that the Lord, you know, for whatever they did, good or bad, whether he was the one that did bad and, and, and was getting what he deserved, or they were doing bad, nonetheless, trust in God, they'll, they'll get what they deserve. So, we will get what we deserve 
out of this time, out of this COVID virus. These circumstances, these uncertain, these wacky, crazy times, we have God to look to for a sense of peace, for a sense of hope, for a sense of security, for the sense of, of protection and safety and security. Answers are all with Him. So look past the COVID-19 and see God and rest in Him. Amen. Amen. Well, Ernie, what song are you going to close us with? King of Kings. Okay. And then you can pray us all out. And say, uh, sing King of Kings, Majesty by uh, Gerard Cooper, if you guys want to search it. itself just responds to you Lord Lord I pray uh, Lord that we just respond to you Father as being the King Lord and have that mindset Lord that you are over everything that you are sovereign Father and in, in you we can trust in all times Lord and in you we can be silent and wait Lord for salvation wait mm -hmm. for help that comes from you mm -hmm. Lord uh, there's no other help that we can get Lord from you, Lord, but I just uh, thank you for this word, and I pray that it just uh, just really uh, ministers to us, Lord. Yes, Lord. 
Yes. Just minister to our souls, to our bearings, our heart, our mind, every single part of our bodies, Lord. Thank you for everything that you are. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you very much. Do you want to say anything? Good. Good night. Good, Good night. <laughs>